So we're now going to look at the relativistic Doppler effect. Now we've seen the Doppler effect before in Phys 9110 in the speed camera topic where we can, were considering sound waves. With sound waves, the relative movement between the observer, the source and the medium all mattered. Now with light waves, it's a little bit different as light waves can travel through a vacuum, so there is no medium. And in fact, one of the postulates of special relativity is that there is no preferred reference frame. So we can't have something like the ether, which we can measure or movement relative to. So this means that the Doppler effect for light waves is actually slightly different. So let's consider how we can derive the equations now. So let's consider two observers, observer A and observer B. We'll say that these two observers are at rest in some reference frame S and then we'll put a light source between them and we'll say that the light source is moving with a speed V towards observer A. Now in the reference frame of the two observers, let's say that in some time delta T, the light source emits N wavelengths. So we can say, well, delta T is equal to N times the period of the wave, which is equal to N divided by F. Now, during the time that the source is emitting these wavelengths, the delta T, it's actually moving towards observer A. So it's actually moved the distance V delta T. So the wavelength observed by the observer at A is going to be equal to C delta T minus V delta T divided by N. And the wavelength is also equal to C divided by F. So combining these two equations, we can say, well, F is equal to C times N divided by C minus V times delta T. And then just to simplify that a little bit and get it into some easier terms to use, let's divide both the top and the bottom by C, the speed of light. So we've got N divided by 1 minus V on C times delta T. And then we'll replace V on C with beta, which is used fairly often in relativity. So we've now got that the frequency is equal to N divided by 1 minus beta times delta T. Now in relativity, we tend to consider things in two frames. So let's now jump to the frame in which the light source is at rest, the primed frame, and write down what we know in this frame. So in this frame, we can count the same number of wavelengths, capital N, but in this frame, that is equal to the frequency of the light in this frame, which we can represent as FO, the rest frequency, the frequency as measured in the rest frame, times delta T prime, as we're now in the prime frame, so this takes that amount of time. Now we can relate those time intervals between the S frame and the S prime frame using time dilation as the light source is at rest in the prime frame. So using time dilation, we can write, well, delta T is equal to delta T prime divided by the square root of one minus V squared on C squared. So this can be rearranged and written as delta T prime divided by delta T is equal to the square root of one minus beta squared. So now what we can do is combine all this with the equation that we had before for the frequency as measured in the unprimed frame. So what we will do is we'll replace that N with FO times delta T prime. So we end up with F is equal to FO times delta T prime over delta T times one minus beta on the bottom. Now we can replace the delta T prime over the delta T with our expression from time dilation. So this gives us that F is equal to FO times one minus beta squared to the power of a half divided by one minus beta. Now let's do a little bit of algebra. This is equal to FO 
And then because we've got 1 minus beta squared inside the brackets, inside the brackets we can write 1 minus beta, 1 plus beta, and then we can write the bottom, 1 minus beta, as the square root of 1 minus beta times 1 minus beta. And then you can see that under a square root sign on the top and the bottom, we've got a factor of 1 minus beta. So these will cancel out, and this is equal to F0 times the square root of 1 plus beta my, divided by 1 minus beta. So looking at this, we can see that the frequency f is going to be larger than the frequency f0. So if we're getting an increased frequency, we're getting a shorter wavelength. So this is known as a blue shift, as the wavelength of the light is shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum, away from the red end of the spectrum. So as a light source approaches an observer, we observe a higher frequency. Now we can also consider what happens to the light observed by observer B. So the light source is in fact receding away from observer B. So we can work through similar steps for observer B and come up with the equation that the frequency observed by observer B where the light is receding is equal to the square root of 1 minus beta over 1 plus beta times FO. And this is known as a redshift. So when a light is receding from an observer, the whole spectrum is shifted towards the red. So we'll actually see this again in Phys 9140 when we look at cosmology and the Big Bang. Some of the evidence that the universe is in fact expanding comes from the redshift of light from distant galaxies. So it's observed that all distant galaxies are receding from the Earth because all of their spectra are shifted towards the red. And this tells us that because everything's moving away from us, at one point in the past it all must have been a lot closer together, so the universe is all expanding. And this is good evidence for the Big Bang Theory. So let's have a look at an example problem now. So the question. The wavelength of light arriving at Earth from a distant galaxy is observed to be 0.5% longer than light generated in the same atomic transition on Earth. What is the velocity of the galaxy along the line connecting the galaxy to Earth? Okay, so we've got that lambda is longer than lambda naught, and because we've got the equation c is equal to f lambda, where c is the speed of light, if we've got a longer wavelength, we've got a shorter frequency. So this tells us that f is less than fo. And we've said that if we have a lower frequency, then it indicates that we have a receding source. So the equation that we use for a receding source is that the frequency is equal to the square root of 1 minus beta over 1 plus beta times the frequency as measured at the source in the reference frame in which it is at rest. Okay, so we can write this as f over f naught. Now f divided by f naught, looking up at the c equals f lambda equation, c is constant in the frame of f, the s frame and the s prime frame. So we can write, well, f is equal to c over lambda. So we can write this as lambda naught over lambda, and we've got a c and a c there, which we have effectively cancelled out just using this equation here. And so this is equal to the square root of 1 minus beta over 1 plus beta. And so what we'll do now is rearrange this. So what we'll do now is rearrange this part of the equation because in the question we're given information about lambda naught and lambda. Okay, so we can write, well, lambda naught over lambda squared is equal to 1 minus beta over 1 plus beta and so we've got lambda naught over lambda squared times 1 plus beta 
is equal to 1 minus beta. We'll get all the betas over one side. So we've got beta outside of lambda naught over lambda squared and then plus 1, moving this beta over to this side. And then we'll move everything without a beta over to the right hand side. So we've got this 1 and then we've got minus lambda naught over lambda squared. So we can write well beta, which is V on C, is equal to 1 minus lambda naught over lambda squared divided by lambda naught over lambda squared plus 1. Okay, so let's look at what lambda naught over lambda is. So we've got lambda naught over lambda. We're told that the observed one, which is lambda, is 0.5% longer than the one generated in the lab. So we've got 100% generated in the lab and 100.5% observed. So this is equal to 0 0.995. So we can substitute this into here. So this is equal to 1 minus 0 0.995 squared over 0 0.995 squared plus 1. So this is equal to 5.01 times 10 to the minus 3. So we can write, well, V is equal to this times C. We could either write it with the C or we could substitute in the value for the speed of light. And so this is equal to 1.50 times 10 to the 6 meters per second is how quickly this galaxy is receding from Earth. So we should say, because it's asked for the velocity, we should give the direction, so away from the Earth. So notice that with this solution, it tells us how quickly the source is moving along this line. We've calculated this speed here. It doesn't tell us if the source is moving at all in this direction perpendicular to the line joining the Earth and the galaxy. The source moving this way wouldn't result in any change to the wavelength.